Good evening all, and welcome. Just a little reminder that we have a nice little competition going on. When we hit 3,000 followers on Twitter and Instagram, two little prizes, well, nice prizes, will be released. And yeah, two of you will, will win. That's pretty nice. So feel free to follow me over there to be in the chance for winning. We're very, very close. But for now, it's time to get comfortable and let the darkness take control. This story took place in Texas back in the fall of 94. I was traveling from a small town outside of Dallas called Grapevine and was heading to my station in Lebeau, Texas. I would never take this route again after what happened this night along I-20. I was traveling alone and had left around 7 p.m. on my road trip across Texas. If you've ever been to Texas, then you know that you can drive for hours on end and still be in Texas. Anyway, this story takes place about 30 minutes outside of Abilene and would change my life forever. I decided to stop at a rest stop along the highway to stretch my legs and to take a leak. I noticed a woman in a late 70s model Ford parked in the lot when I got out. I went in, did my business, had a smoke, and before I left, I noticed the woman was still sitting in her car. So I walked over and knocked on the window, which startled her. I asked if she was okay and needed help. She smiled and said that her tire was flat and that her battery had died while she was waiting there. I asked if she had a spare tire and she said no. And I asked if anyone was going to get her and she said her daughter was supposed to, but it's been several hours of waiting. I asked her where she was going and she said, Abilene. I offered to give her a ride if she wanted. She started crying and said that would be wonderful. So we started heading there and making small talk. I told her I was in the Air Force and heading to Lubbo. And she said that was wonderful and hoped that I really enjoyed it. I did notice that she kept looking in the mirror. So I asked if everything was okay with me giving her a ride. She smiled and said everything was fine. And she was just happy that someone had stopped. So we finally get to her house in a small suburb just out of town. She thanked me for her ride and hands me a scrap of paper with her home number on it. She asked that I can call her when I get to my destination. So she knows that I made it safely. I thanked her and said I would, but I wait until the morning since I knew it would be late when I arrived in Lubbo. I arrived at Reese's Air Force Base later that night and stayed on the base hotel. I got checked in, took a shower and went to bed. The next morning, I got up, got dressed for the day and went to find my unit HQ. I didn't even think about the night before. I had so much to do checking squared away. It wouldn't be for another two weeks before I came across that scrap of paper with the number. I felt bad that I hadn't kept my promise to call. So I decided to stop what I was doing and give her a call. I called the number and a young woman answered the phone. So I asked for Sandy. The woman on the line said, who? So I apologized and said, maybe it's Sandra. She asked who this was. I gave her my name and explained that I had given her a ride a few weeks back. She said that I must be confused. And I read the number off the paper in my hand just in case I dialed the wrong one. She said I had the correct number. But I couldn't have given her mother a ride home because she'd passed away in the early 80s. She was apparently driving home and began having car troubles. So she stopped at a rest stop just outside of town. When she didn't make it home, her father, the woman I was talking with became concerned. And it was at the time that there was a knock on their door. And two state troopers and a local police officer were there. She said that a trooper saw the vehicle stopped at the rest stop, stopped to check it out. And what they found gave her chills. Her mother had been brutally assaulted and her head had been bashed in. Someone had cut her tires and disconnected her battery. The worst part was that she didn't perish right away as there were bloody handprints on the windows, steering wheel and shifter, like she was trying to leave. The trooper said they didn't have any suspects 
but there were times maybe certain motorcycle clubs would pass through at night. I described the car and what her mother looked like and what she was wearing as best I could recall. She definitely didn't look old enough to have a daughter my age. Her daughter just started crying and asked I not call back. A few days later, I received word to report to the squadron commander. So I headed over to the building. When I arrived, my captain called me into his office and began asking me questions about where I lived and when did I drive in and what route I took. Immediately, I knew something was wrong. We then went into a briefing room when my commanding officer and a Texas Ranger and state trooper were seated. I introduced myself and took a seat. They began by asking me the same questions my captain had previously asked and why I had called the number and spoke with the woman. I explained everything as clear and impossible detail. They then finished taking notes and the Ranger asked who needed a smoke. My commanding officer excused himself and the captain, the two officers and myself stepped out back into the smoking area. This was when the Ranger informed me he was the trooper who had found the car back in the early 80s and that the only reason he came out today was because of the details I mentioned in the phone call to the daughter. The trooper said that they get calls about a stranded woman every so often, but when they get there, they never find anything. In closing, be careful who you decide to help because not everyone is what they seem to be. I'd like to state that the reason specific timeframes are not given is due to the personal nature of these events. I was driving by myself on a highway in Maine, cranking killer tunes, slamming Mountain Dew, big gulps, and sucking back American spirit lights. I decided to go wild hog at a Taco Bell drive through and ordered an enormous amount of food, extra fillings. So I'm devouring the Taco Bell, had a full menu assortment, live mass, and of course, about 40 minutes after I ate, my stomach began seizing and cramping. There were to be no refunds, no returns, but luckily, I see a rest stop sign coming up soon, in about two miles. So I floor it and pull in. It's about 1.30 am, and it seems pretty vacant. There's only one other vehicle in the lot with the window steamed up. So I assume it's just someone else on a road trip. No judgment. I get up my car and run to the men's room. I was holding the bottom of my pants when I ran because honestly, I wasn't sure if I was going to make it or not. This was very close to being a cold brown. Finally, I'm in the stall and it's not a good scene. Figuring I would be in there a while, I brought my smokes and a copy of Mad Magazine that I always keep in my car for emergencies. I'm working on my fourth American spirit when I hear another person come in. Footsteps stomp. I hear him taking deep breaths. I holler out, Hey man, I'd keep those breaths shallow. No response. I can see the dude's feet right in front of the stall. They're huge got to be at least size 17. Absolutely filthy as well. I sit in silence staring at these huge shoes. Suddenly, arse blasts squeeze out and the sound echoes in the empty room. All of a sudden, the guy starts pounding on the door, then grabbing at the top and shaking it. I'll be out in a minute, I scream. Then it stops. I hear the footsteps again and then a lot of squeaking then footsteps again, and then the door opening and slamming shut. Of course, there was no toilet paper in the stall, and it was not a clean pinch, as you can imagine. I had to sacrifice my mad magazine. Alfred E. Newman has never been so disrespected. I exit the stall and see in marker written on the mirror, see you outside. It was signed, Nitro. I'm born and bred in Maine. I've met a lot of guys who go by Nitro. Not a one do I want to meet alone in a rest stop in the middle of nowhere in the middle of the night. So I'm terrified. I hatch a plan that I'm just going to go for it. I open the restroom door and sprint to my car, not looking back and I run. 
and I hear shuffles and footsteps behind me. I hear a scream approaching. I left my car unlocked because it is not the best. And then I jump right in, get the car going and do a burnout and speed off. I see in my rear view mirror the silhouette of a massive man. He threw his hat on the ground and began jumping up and down as I sped down the highway. No idea what the intentions were, but this was easily a top five scary moment for me. And I can't bring myself to poop in a public restroom since. This is something that happened to my best friend and I a few years ago. While my best friend at the time and I were seniors in high school in 2016, we went on a weekend trip to visit my grandmother a few hours away from my town in Georgia, USA. The town we lived in was comparatively small for the state, but one of the biggest towns within a few hours. But we had to travel about two and a half hours through tiny, somewhat redneck towns to get to my grandmother's place. We were on our way back home when we had to stop at a gas station literally in the middle of nowhere. I'm talking cornfields, cotton fields, streets with no signs or lights, not even stop signs, and definitely no cell service. The convenience store attached to the gas station had maybe a few snacks inside but looked deserted from the outside. And there were no other cars nor people in sight. And we didn't bother to get anything other than gas. I paid with my card, mainly because I didn't want to leave my five foot 100 pound friend alone in the car while I went inside alone. Another car pulled up on the other side of the single gas pump while I started pumping gas. And because of everything I'd read and heard about on YouTube and Reddit, I'd already had a weird feeling and decided to stay alert and stand outside the car with my driver's side door open so my friend can see and hear everything that was going on. That's when a thin, late 50s-ish older man got out the car and seemed to be paying at the pump and standing beside his car while he got gas. But after a few seconds, he walked around the pump and maneuvered himself around my car door to stand within a foot of me and asked if he could pump my gas for me. Luckily, the gas nozzle was locked, so it was pumping without me having to hold it. And I immediately placed myself between the opening of the door and the man and prepared to either shut the door with me inside it or move and slam it behind me to protect my friend if necessary. I calmly told him no thank you and that it was fine. He looked up and down at me with the corner of his lip tilted and said, pretty girls like you shouldn't be out here all alone. And you definitely shouldn't have to do this by yourself. Let a man help you, baby. And covered my hand with his own as he reached for the gas pump I was holding. I jerked my hand from underneath his and slammed my car door shut, thinking the last thing I would want is for him to jump in my car and drive away with my friend in the passenger seat. Orange flags started tinging red and my usually over polite demeanor turned serious. And I remembered something that I'd read before on this subreddit. And it said better safe and to seem mean rather than polite and uncomfortable. And they're right. So I responded, Sir, get away from me. I can pump my own gas and I've already said no thank you. Leave us alone. He didn't move. Only raised his chin and managed to make kind contact with me. All lip tilt. Gone. I stared him down and figured I'd gotten enough gas to last us enough time to get the hell out of wherever we were. So I maintained eye contact, pulled the nozzle out and basically threw it back on the pump before getting in my car and driving away before he'd even noticed. As we drove away, I glanced in the rear view mirror and saw that his car wasn't even being filled up with gas, telling me he was driving by and decided to help a damsel in distress out. My friend was shaking the whole way home, telling me she would have just let the man pump her gas. But I'm just glad some of the confidence I gained from learning about these stories helped me stay attentive and respond confidently enough to get out of this situation. So creepy gas man in the middle of the ghost town in Georgia, let's not meet.
This incident occurred this last spring. Let me set the scene and give a little bit of backstory. I was driving from Minnesota to Iowa for a music festival and decided to leave Thursday night because one, I generally prefer road tripping at night as there's less vehicles on the road and two, I wanted to get to the festival grounds as early as possible to secure a good camping spot. Fellow festival goers will surely know what I mean. All is going well. I'm about two hours away from Des Moines and I realize that I really have to pee. Now for those of you unfamiliar with long drives, mostly rural interstate highways, rest areas can be a godsend when the gas station, especially the ones open after midnight, are few and far between. So I see a sign for a rest area coming up in two miles. Perfect. I pull in and there's nothing, maybe three other cars in the lot. They are generally quite quiet on first glance. Nothing seems out the ordinary. However, I just have a general feeling of unease as I pull into park. And I'm not one to ignore my intuitive reaction to things, but I just really have to pee. Luckily, my little brother had given me this badass little taser because he knows I often like to go adventuring in various wooded areas and whatnot, usually at night, and he wants me to be safe. I grab it just in case and run to use the bathroom. Not 30 seconds later, I close my stall door and I'm the only one in the building when I hear someone yelling, babe, it's unintelligible. It could have been babe or my name, just the way they were hollering. At this point, my heart started beating pretty fast and I'm hoping he leaves the general building, but no, I hear the main door to the women's restroom get kicked open and of course he comes to the only stall door that shut and starts mumbling something I can't make out. And in my sternest possible voice, just said, dude, what do you want? He finally says something I can make out. I'm looking for my girlfriend. You don't know me. Get the hell out of here, I reply. He proceeds to ask my name, like, dude, I'm not even your girlfriend. And at this point, he starts shaking the door. So I turn on the taser and repeated, get out before hitting the little button that makes the taser do its thingy. Luckily, as I hoped, just the sound of it was enough for him to quickly get out and repeatedly apologize. I sat there for a good 10 minutes trying to regain my composure and then quickly walked out to my vehicle, taser at the ready and booked it out of there immediately. I hate getting gas at night. I have learned to avoid it as I've had some strange encounters that have left me feeling uncomfortable, but none as bad as this one. I had just picked up my sister from college and as we got on the highway to get home, my gas light came on. It was getting dark out. I was kicking myself for not getting gas sooner, but it made me feel safer that I had my sister with me. So I get off the highway and pull into the closest gas station that I can find. It was completely empty. I had just put the pump in my car when I heard, Hey, sweetheart, you're from around here. I jumped. This man had seemed to have appeared out of thin air. He was tall, older and disheveled, his clothes baggy and twisted. Immediately, I felt uncomfortable, but I didn't want to jump to conclusions nor be rude. Yeah, kinda. He started asking more questions, taking a step closer to me with each successive one. He was rattling them off so quickly. I didn't even have time to answer him. The questions were getting more and more personal and he was getting closer still. I was getting increasingly uncomfortable. Then finally he asked, you married? For context, I'm 23, but I've been told I still look like a teenager. This question obviously took me by surprise. I didn't know how to answer it, so I looked away. The man cleared his throat. Excuse me, miss, are you married? Now, he was within touching distance of me. It finally clicked what he was doing. 
trying to see if there was anyone who would look for me if I disappeared. This realization sent shivers down my spine. So I shouted at him to get away from me. Startled, he jumped back and said, you ungrateful entitled and kept cursing at me as he walked away. It took me a good half hour until I finally stopped shaking. So creepy old dude at the gas station, learn some manners and let's not meet again. I worked as a CNA at a place about 40 minutes away from me and my shift ends at 11 PM. This night I stopped at a gas station only about six minutes away from my house to fill up my tank. While my gas is pumping, a big van pulls up and decides to park at the pump in front of me instead of the tons of empty ones around. One man hops out the passenger side, opens the trunk doors and starts to head towards me. Now this gas station, pallets of salt bags were placed between pumps outside. In my head, I thought he was going towards the pallet due to the crazy snow we're having. Instead, he walks past the pallet right up to my car. Once he reaches my car, the first instinct told me to pull out my pepper spray and say, if you take one more step, I'm going to blind you. He turns around immediately, shuts the trunk doors and hops into the passenger seat again. The van peels off. And that was that. Not super long or crazy, but still pretty terrifying when it's happening to you. So please, if you work late hours, avoid gas stations. They clearly had bad intentions. And if I wasn't carrying the pepper spray, who knows what would have happened to me? I certainly don't want to think about it. Me and my girlfriend were in a city in Texas off the highway, and we stopped at a tiny gas station to get beer and chips and such. For some reason, when we pulled in, I felt the need to say, I actually think I need to come in with you. That was weird because I usually just stay in the car when we go places and when I get out and I don't feel the need to announce it. When we walked in, everything felt normal. We were just laughing and joking about how the half naked Modelo girl cardboard cutout had a super pixelated face. We started looking at the beer and I was being indecisive, but I could tell we were both getting really sketched out. So I just grabbed two coconut margarita type drinks without thinking about it and rushed to the counter because we needed to get out of there. There was a growing feeling of being watched. It was like pure malice. I hadn't felt anything like it before. There was an old Hispanic man leaning on the ice cream cooler right by the counter watching every customer. Everything felt slow. It's hard to explain. When I put my stuff on the counter, the man started smiling at us really wide and talking in a very strange manner like he was trying to be charming or personable. But he just came off as really strange. Outside the door, I could see a man in a red jacket also staring at the doors, just watching and waiting. They were waiting. I can't explain the overwhelming feeling of dread we had, and we didn't talk about it until we were driving out of the parking lot, and the man in the red jacket was still circling the building watching the car drive off. This city we're in has a bad reputation for people being taken, and I honestly think that they were waiting for the perfect victim. I think if we hadn't have gone in time, or if I hadn't gone in with my girlfriend, she would have been taken, or I would have been taken from the car. I've never had such an intense looming feeling of doom and paranoia. It seems very mundane, but it was definitely a very close call. And we kept discussing it the rest of the night and how lucky we were that we went in together and got out as quickly as we could. I was driving late at night on I-90 between Deer Lodge and Missoula. I'm originally from Seattle, and I was driving back there after visiting family in Bosman and Billings. This stretch of freeway between Deer Lodge and Missoula has some weird small mountain towns along the side, occasionally interrupted by large truck stops. It's about 1130 at night, and I'm on my way to my hotel in Missoula when I notice that I need to get some gas for my car. 
I stop off in this random small town with one gas station and a 24-hour pump. It had a convenience store attached to it, but it was closed. I get this really weird vibe from the station as soon as I pull up to the pump. I hadn't turned off my car yet. I had just put it in park and the engine was still running. I was about to shut off my car when out of the corner of my eye I see some dark figure come from the side of the closed convenience store and start running towards my car. Some instinct in my head kicks in and I put the car back into drive and got the hell out of there. I looked back in my rearview mirror to see the figure chasing after my car for a few seconds. By that time, I make the turn that gets me onto the freeway, and I found a brightly lit truck stop 10 miles down the road where I filled up my car. Needless to say, that weirded me the hell out for the rest of my drive to Missoula and Seattle. I've heard it before and experienced it that night. Strange things happen in the mountains. We were on a road trip back from a wedding. We were in who knows where Indiana at about 2 a.m. and my friend had to pee. So we pulled into the gas station that looked like it'd been abandoned or at least part of a post-apocalyptic aftermath. And he decided he needed to go behind the building to pee real quick. There was one car running with the driver sitting in the parking lot, which happened to be 20 feet from the side of the building he just walked behind. All three of us remained in the car and were watching him like a hawk. And he got out and stood by the passenger side of his car, kind of looking towards where my friends were, super shady. All three of us simultaneously unbuckled our seatbelts, because if he'd started heading back that way, all three of us were too. Anticlimactic, nothing ever happened. He got back into the car after what seemed like an eternity. My friend got in completely unaware of what happened and drove off. This story, I've never had an explanation for, but here goes. A number of years ago, I was doing a big solo drive. I don't want to say from where or to where, but it was at least a 10 hour drive, which I was splitting up over two days. It was about 2 AM and I knew I needed to sleep. In the distance, after about a mile, I see a rest stop and pull up opting to take a nap for a few hours so that I can reach my destination in the morning. That's when I turn my car engine off, turn off the little lights and recline my seat, lock the vehicle and try to get comfortable for what I'm hoping is no more than a few hours worth of sleep. I'm about 10 minutes into tossing and turning, unable to find a comfortable position in my car, but my exhaustion is almost getting the better of me. That's when I hear something. My ears perk up and I slowly bring my head to look out the window. It's quite dark and I see figures coming from the tall grass. They're moving out of the darkness, holding up old looking torches. I see them move past the rest stop and cross the road. There must have been about a hundred of these hooded figures, all wearing black with their old timey lanterns. I couldn't stop staring at them. Were they ghosts? What the hell was going on here? I just about soiled myself in fear when one of the hooded figures with a lantern looks over in my direction. I stare back at him, speechless clueless as to about what's happening next. He just gives me a little nod, a nod that says, you didn't see anything. And with a little tinge of malice in his eye, I nod back and he looks away and walks on. They make it to the other end and go who knows where. Safe to say I pushed my seat back up, turned the car back on, double checked the locks and kept on driving. I made it there in record time and no longer stop at rest stops for naps anymore. We stopped at a rest stop in Florida. I've been to this particular stop several times and I must note that I've always picked up creepy vibes from it, but it's a rest stop. So what do you expect? I got out the car and walked to the ladies room. 
When you walk in, there were sinks on the left and stores on the right, and straight ahead at the end of the room was a door labelled staff only. So I went into the stall and did my business. When I stepped out, I started washing my hands. Everything was normal. Suddenly I heard a door open, so I glanced to my right, fully expecting to see someone walk out the stall. To my surprise, it was a man walking out of the staff only door. I stood there for a moment, just staring at him as he stared back. He shoveled over to a stall and walked inside, and walked out and started heading to the next stall in it. I didn't take the time to see what he was doing, I just got out there quickly. It was pretty creepy. I thought about it could have just all been a misunderstanding. Maybe he thought it was empty and had to clean it. The only problem was he had no cleaning supplies, and usually a female would clean the girl's bathroom. There should have been a female co-worker there with him if he did have to clean it. It could have been innocent, but nonetheless, it did creep me out. This little town on the border of Ohio looked completely abandoned, or populated by bums. My fiancé and I found it on our way back from Myrtle Beach, because I really had to go. It was aptly named Point Pleasant, and was a mile away from us between West Virginia and Ohio. Pulling into it was this dishevelled man trying to hitch a ride, but we know better than to pick up strangers, especially one who looked strung out on some kind of drug. We found a place that marketed itself as a cafe, so we figured it must have a restroom. It had an open sign on the window and blacked out doors, so we figured it's a 50-50 shot of being open or abandoned. We pulled on the door and it doesn't budge. And as I'm walking to the car, this woman comes out the door and talks to my fiance and agrees to let me use the bathroom. We get inside, and it looks like some miniature bar slash casino. It had floor slot machines against the wall, and some other machines, but I didn't pay attention to them because I rushed into the bathroom. On my way out, I didn't see my fiancé anywhere, so I figure he's in the car. The woman who let me in kept asking where I was heading, which might have been her attempt at polite small talk, but I was quite eager to leave. On my way to the car, Hobo Joe, who was hitchhiking earlier, spotted me walking there. I go and peer inside my future husband was nowhere to be found, so I started checking all the doors, which proved to be no good. Hobo Joe was starting to get close when my fiancé comes out of the creepy casino after using the bathroom himself. He sees what's going on and speed walks over to me. Hobo Joe was walking towards me in a threatening stance and asking me something. At this point, I'm wigged out of my guard, and do not register what his words were. Or maybe he was just making guttural noises, since my fiancé was quite adamant that he also had no clue what was said, either. We both managed to safely haul our asses into the car and lock the doors. We go around the building, and Hobo Joe isn't following. As we headed over the bridge, we see Mr. Joe at a stoplight, trying to hitchhike. The light was turning red, and he positioned himself to start running in front of the car to make us stop. We gunned it, and managed to get out of Point Pleasant intact, and got home sooner or later. My friends and I went to a festival near LA in August. My girlfriend and I take my car and four of our friends are in another one. Our GPS app took us two different driving routes from LA back to San Francisco. We stopped for gas about four hours into the trip. My girl and I are just standing around the car talking, letting the cold air wake us up before heading back out. Just as we're getting ready to go, an older pickup truck parks next to us, and a dude gets out the car and stares at my girlfriend. I open her door for her, and his eyes dart towards me. My girlfriend gets in the car and slams the door shut, so there I am standing with this guy waiting for something to happen. Do you believe in God? Great. I'm gonna be murdered in front of my girlfriend. Not wanting to upset him, I put my personal views aside and said, Yes, 
what came out of his mouth for the next half hour were the most vile and twisted interpretations of the Bible I had ever heard. Things like, God only made gay sick as a test for those faithful to him. Sex workers with tattoos will be playthings for those of us that reach heaven. The darker you are, the more sin you have to atone for in hell. I was very uncomfortable. My girlfriend had a full sleeve tattoo on both arms, and we were both non-white. I'm starting to get upset, but not wanting to get into an altercation with him. I give a lot of, mmm, sure. I get a phone call and go check it. My girlfriend's calling me from inside the car. I look back at him and say, I should probably take this, wish him a good night, and walk back to the driver door. As I turn, he grabs my shoulder, and I can feel every muscle on my body tense up. I turn to him again, and he hugs me, whispering some prayer or another thing into my ear. The last thing he said to me before I got in the car was, Be safe, brother. Don't fall for God's traps. I drive off, and was a little too shaken to talk about anything. Eventually, we started joking about it, but I still am very apprehensive every time I take a trip down to LA. I was driving a rental car at 3am. Just my friend Theo and I heading home at the end of a busy road trip. We were on a twisting two lane road, the kind with no street lights, the kind that weaves through the mountains. We wanted to make it back before dawn, but a few hours from home, exhaustion hit us. Bleary eyed, desperately trying to stay awake, we looked ahead for some place we could stop, anywhere with lights. There was almost no signal on our phones to search for options, so we were relieved to finally see a distant gas station through the trees up ahead. It had been the only building and lights we could see for miles. As I drove towards it, I saw a blur and realized I just passed someone. A man walking a few paces off the side of the road, just at the edge of the woods. My brief glimpse had shown him in dark clothes, something long resting on his shoulders. Huh? Theo said. I made some, hmm? In the sound of acknowledgement. We'd both seen it. Weird. But we weren't concerned. We were too exhausted to care. And then we were both frustrated when the gas station turned out to be a small medical clinic, long ago converted from a gas station. They'd kept the typical awning above where the gas pumps would be, and the lights were on the outside. But the office was dark. We eased down the narrow gravel drive and paused in front of the buildings anyway, trying to get enough signal on our phones to look for a hotel, or somewhere safe to nap. Signal was still spotty, so we were resorting to paper maps. Neither of us felt great about this spot, even if it was a little island of light in the dark area. This was when the man showed up in my rear view mirror, continuing to walk along, keeping at the edge of the pool of light. I had an immediate bad feeling and started the engine. No lights, just engine. I didn't want to blind some poor guy trying to get somewhere if that's all he was. He passed us by. I saw his back and realized he was carrying a flag on his shoulder wrapped with a cord. I couldn't quite make out the type of flag. It looked like it might be a US flag, but it didn't quite look right. The bars were too thick and not quite enough, and I couldn't see if the stars were there at all. Hard to tell in the dark with the flag curled up. His clothing looked old too like some strange combination of a military surplus store, but I'd seen old clothing on drifters before. He just passed on, kept walking in the dark out of the light and out of sight. I told myself he was just a local walking home from his hole in the wall bar or a homeless man heading to the next town. I told myself the exhaustion was getting to me and making me paranoid. We looked at the map for some time, cursing our bad signal, and finally had figured our route. And we tried to look for the nearest large town to either get a hotel room or just a safe parking lot to nap in. 
We got ready to go. I told Theo he could put his seat back to take a nap. I tried my phone again watching the signal flicker in and out, then sighed and checked the paper map once more. Ready to go, I turned on high beams to check on the narrow road that led out of the lot and my adrenaline shot up. Best energy drink I could have. The man hadn't walked on, he stood there in the dark, and now my brights lit him up. Facing us now, dirty clothes, dark military style boots with a dark complexion, and a huge smile. That smile raised the hair on the back of my neck. It seemed all sorts of wrong to me. He was staring at the car just grinning, and he was blocking the little road in front of our lot. I waited to see if this guy wanted to mess with me. He'd have to come closer. He had waited a good distance away. I could wait for him to move. I checked behind me, gauging if I could back up. But it had been a weird turn into the place, a gravel road, plus several concrete poles to move between, and it would not be a speedy path in reverse. I didn't know this car well, and I was not confident I could reverse it without getting into an accident. I glanced at my sleeping friend. Then the guy was suddenly in front of our car. I'm still not sure how we could have done that. It must have been only a few seconds while I was looking away. I can only blame the exhaustion, how he was suddenly just there, lights shining on his white teeth in his huge weird grin. I must have made a noise, because my friend woke and sat up. The hell? He managed, and the guy just stared at us, just grinning at us in the headlights, standing right in front of my car, just grinning. Some crazy guy, I murmured. We had both lived in big cities, dealt with crazy types before, if they weren't armed. Usually there were nothing to worry about, and I saw no weapon, and I was wary, but not afraid. Then I noticed a heavy looking point at the end of his flagpole, still resting against his shoulder, and the mental image of him spearing into our windshield, or just down into the hood of my car was suddenly vivid. I had no idea what was going on, but I did not want to give this middle of the night crazy guy a reason to attack the car, and I knew I couldn't reverse quickly to get out of there. I waited, mentally willing the weird nutcase to walk on with his weird flagpole and clothes. I have no idea how long he stood there, just staring at us and grinning, and after what seemed like a long moment he began moving, but moving against the car, sliding to the side, slowly coming around to one side, but dragging himself against the side of the car as he moved. The car shifted slightly with the weight, and I could hear the side of cloth drag and the wooden flagpole on by the side of the car. A small, ridiculous part of my brain congratulated me on buying the insurance for the rental car, as I was sure he was scratching it. The grinning man gripped the driver's side mirror, as if using it for support, and leaned down. I saw a glimpse of a grin through my side window and looked away. I suddenly did not want to look at that freakish smile when it was only inches away from my face, just a little glass between us. Theo leaned over slightly, looking through the window and I saw my friend shake his head. No. I saw the grinning man make a hand gesture and Theo said louder and more forcefully, No. The man straightened, no longer leaning on the car. I saw his fist grip on the pole, and I gunned it out of there. And he just stood there. The dark figure just stayed in the pool of light as I shot out onto the dark road. No longer sleepy at all, we had no problem staying awake to the next town where we found a motel. Creepy guy, let's not meet again. This happened about six months ago. Me and my brother were eating at a rest stop taking breaks before we reached back to our university almost two states away. While we're eating, this girl around the age of 10 to 12 suddenly greeted us in a sing-song fashion that made me perplexed. Her words were scripted, like for a child's commercial. Then she said she wanted to promote some products. I was stunned. How could there be an organization that is exploiting kids like this? First and foremost, she asked us to follow their Instagram 
which just shows how they encourage young entrepreneurs. And it looked decent enough, definitely not shady. But this kid approached us with scripted words and unnecessary compliments as a way to make us buy their stuff. And the products are overpriced, a key strap they said was originally 20 Rand, but that they would sell it to us for 10. I know goddamn well I could probably buy the exact same one at half the price. She also offered us some masks because of the haze, but that's overpriced as well, and not the good kind you're supposed to be wearing. She then asked us where we were heading, and we kept it vague and said we're going back to college. She recognized the institute and said that she's from the same state as there. And I was almost fuming because we were two states away, almost three hours on the road, and there was this severely underaged minor promoting products at a rest stop after the sun has set? Where the hell are her parents? Eventually, my brother caved and brought the strap because we both couldn't figure out how to refuse politely this kid that would keep pushing us to buy their stuff. She wasn't the only one there, by the way. There were kids wearing the same t-shirts hovering all over the place, pestering people while they're eating. I know this really isn't that horrifying or disturbing because it's just someone trying to sell you something. But think of the implication here. What kind of person sets their child up in an organization where they just badger people to buy things? I don't think that's right. I think that's definitely a recipe for disaster. Hey guys, it's Mort here and thank you so much for listening. Rest stops sure are creepy. Yes, they certainly are. Well, I hope you enjoyed tonight's video. If you did, please don't forget to let me know down below. Hey, I made a rhyme. Also, don't forget we've got that competition going on, so feel free to check out my Twitter and Instagram if you might want to win some stuff. Completely optional, winning is optional. All that you need to do is to follow me on Twitter and Instagram when we hit 3,000, I'll announce two winners. My wife's made some prizes and I'm gonna be sending off some stuff along with them. All right then guys, well, I hope, like I said before, that you liked the video. You know what to do if you did. As always, a huge thank you to my amazing patrons for their regular support. If you'd like your name at the end of the video and would like some cool prizes to go along with it, feel free to check out my Patreon link in the description. But for now, guys, I'm going to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.